so I realized that I, I skipped something that was kind of important last week when we were discussing typology. What we didn't discuss and what I, I meant to discuss, we ran out of time anyway, but so it would have been the next thing on the agenda, except, um, except that I forgot about it to go on to the covenant. So the, the, the final sort of typological issue is uh, the bread of the presence. So the bread of the presence was um, contained in the holy place. The north side of the bread of presence, uh, the north side of the holy place had a table for the bread of the presence. And the south side opposite the table had a lampstand. And then the holy place was to the east. Um, I mean, the holy of holies is to the east. So the holy place is the room that contained the Ark of the Covenant. And, and it was into the holy, uh, I mean, the holy, uh, the holy of holies contained the Ark of the Covenant. I seem to be dropping holies and getting confused with the number of holies, but so we have the holy place, which contains the lampstand on the south, table for the bread of the presence on the north. The holy of holies is to the east, that's entered only one day a year by the high priest on the day of atonement to atone, first of all, for his sins and the sins of the priesthood by the sacrifice of a bull, and then for the sins of the people by the sacrifice of a goat or a sheep. So you notice the disparity, a bull for the priests, a, and it's a bull as in the golden calf. Let's take a look at the description of the bread of the presence, it's an exodus chapter 25, verses 23 to 50. And then again in Exodus chapter 37. You shall make a table of acacia wood. Two cubits shall be its length, a cubit its breadth, and a cubit and a half its height. You shall overlay it with pure gold and make a molding of gold around it. The, the point of it, the table being overlaid with gold is that the gold indicates holiness. And so whatever is placed on the golden table, therefore is holy. And you shall make around it a frame, a handbreadth wide and a molding of gold around the frame. You shall make for it four rings of gold and fasten the rings into the four corners at its four legs. Close to the frame, the rings shall lie as holders for the poles to carry the table. You shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold and the table shall be carried with these. And you shall make its plates and dishes for incense and its flagons and bowls with which to pour libations of pure gold you shall make them. And you shall set the bread of the presence on the table before me always. So notice everything here is gold, including the, uh, the bulls and the flagons. So the flagons for libation contain wine. So the table of the bread of the presence contains bread and wine. Let's also look at uh, Exodus chapter 37, verses 10 through 16. Could that be why the uh, chalice and um, the stuff that a priest uses, uh, the altar is all gold? Uh, yeah, although, I mean, I've often seen it not being all, all gold. All but, gold, yeah, I've seen but, some. <laughs> But yeah, the, the gold indicates the presence of something that's holy. When I was growing up, it was always gold. Gold. <laughs> yeah. 
but not now so much. May I read? Uh huh, certainly. And also read on about the lampstand. So 37 verse 10 to what? Uh, 2 verse 24. He made the table out of acacia wood, 88 centimeters long, 44 centimeters wide, and 66 centimeters high. He covered it with pure gold and put a gold border around it. He made a rim 75 millimeters wide, round it, and put a gold border round the rim. He made four carrying rings of gold for it and put them at the four corners where the legs were. The rings to hold the poles for carrying the table were placed near the rim. He made the poles of acacia wood and covered them with gold. He made the dishes of pure gold for the table the plates, the cups, the jars, and the bowls to be used for the wine offering. He made the lampstand of pure gold. He made it its base and its shaft of hammered gold. Its decorative flowers, including buds and petals, formed one piece with it. Six branches extended from each side three from each side. Each of the six branches had three decorative flowers shaped like almond blossoms with balls and petals. The shaft of the lampstand had four decorative flowers shaped like almond blossoms with balls and petals. There was one board below each of the three pairs of branches. The boards the branches and the lampstand were a single piece of pure hammered gold. He made seven lamps for the lampstand and he made its tongues and trays of pure gold. He used 35 kilograms of pure gold to make the lampstand and all its equipments. Thank you, Jeff. You're welcome. So everything is made of pure gold. The table, the bowls, the, everything on the table of the bread of the presence, the lampstand is uh, uh, of pure gold. The lampstand is a menorah and it has seven cups. The seven is the number of completion of God. So does anyone have any sense of what the significance of the menorah is in the Holy of Holies? That must be a very sacred spot. Yeah. It's sacred, but it's not as sacred as the Holy of Holies. The, the holy place is where the priests ordinarily minister. Um, and then the Holy of Holies is where only the high priest can go on the Day of Atonement. Um, each, the menorah gets lit one candle per day, right? Isn't it seven days of celebration or well, something? Well, during Hanukkah, that, that's for the Hanukkah celebration. Oh. So it's used all so the The... I mean, one of the things with Hanukkah is that the candles threatened to go out and one didn't and it was considered miraculous. Um, but you know, this is well before Hanukkah and, and uh, Hanukkah was, is, you know, was uh, celebrated as, is, is celebrated uh, a celebration of the revolt against the Seleucids and, and uh, um, Antiochus Epiphanes, the Greeks who were mm -hmm. occupying the Holy Land. 
So oh, the, the seven um, candles, you know, on the um, menorah, there's seven candles on this one, right? Okay. And seven is a number for um, sworn oath or oath, you know, when anything, a covenant or a promise was done with seven. Mm-hmm. And it also represents God's people who are the light of the menorah. So what is the purpose of the menorah? So the menorah, the menorah is the... I'm yeah, sorry. I just... I had something that I wanted to share, like I was looking at. The six of the biblical times, the seven branched menorah has symbolic, uh, symbolic Judaism. It is, it appears in Exodus and as a lightning, lightning fixture <clears throat> within the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of portable um temple used by the israelites during their desert wanderings yeah it's moses tabernacle and so once the temple was built it was basically built according to the same arrangement and specifications as the tabernacle, although the, the temple was a much more massive structure. So it says here that the menorah is a symbol of the nation of Israel, and it says its mission to be a light onto the nations, which is in Isaiah mm -hmm. 42. And, and what, what else? What is the menorah doing? Light. Light for light. what? Probably light for the bread of presence. Light for the bread of the presence. Oh. Huh. Right. So the there's, there's um, symbolism here that represents an underlying reality. So the menorah represents, first of all, is a number representing God's completion. It's a number representing covenant. And it's a number representing the people of God. And the people of God are illuminating the bread of the presence. Oh, so that's very, it's very much the same as in Christianity that we're supposed to illuminate God, we're supposed to imitate Christ, we're supposed to reflect and reveal God to the world. We unfortunately tend to do it very, very, very poorly. But that is you know, the design, and that's the goal here. So that's... Is, is, isn't that why we are called Christians, to be Christ-like? Mm -hmm. So the, the bread of the presence has another name. Does anyone know what it is? Eucharist. No. No? The bread of the presence. Oh. It was known. I mean, it was known by a number of names. The bread of the presence, bread of display, bread of offering. It was incorrectly translated and appears in many English language dictionaries as showbread. But there's also another Drug, name yeah. for it. Oh, I've heard of showbread, yeah. Yeah. Okay. The bread was changed every Sabbath. 
Mm -hmm. And the priest ate the old bread, that which had been dis right, mm -hmm. right. It was also called the bread of the face of God. So, mm. so think about that for a moment. God is presumably in the holy of holies. Showing his face. Not showing his face. But in some Through form, bread. that bread is the face of God. But it's separate from God because God is in the holy of holies. And this is the holy place. There's that very, very thick, very tall, very wide curtain that separates them. And then the light, which is holy because its responsibility is to illuminate the face of God, illuminates the face of God. So we have a distinction between God, who is in the Holy of Holies, the face of God, which is at one side of the uh, holy place, and the people of God, the represented by the menorah, who are responsible for illuminating the face of God on the other side of the holy place. So the bread of the presence becomes a visible sign of the invisible God. It's also called the bread of the face of God because Moses, in, in Exodus chapter 25, we were, we, uh, where we read the, the first set of instructions about building uh, the, the table and overlaying it with gold. That follows immediately after the banquet with Moses and the elders with God, which we'll read about when we discuss covenant, but I don't want to, to duplicate it now. So the bread of the presence is a sacrifice. It's a cereal offering. Did we read about cereal offerings? Mm -hmm. oh, Look at Leviticus chapter two. Well, oh, it's S-E-R-I-A-L, not cereal like you eat. No, like you eat. Oh, okay. Yes, it's cereal, C-E-R-E-A-L. Okay. So Leviticus chapter two. Verse one, when anyone brings a cereal offering as an offering to the Lord, his offering shall be a fine flour. He shall pour oil upon it and put frankincense on it and bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests. And he shall take from it a handful of the fine flour and oil with all of its, frank, with all of its frankincense. And the priest shall burn this as its memorial portion upon the altar, an offering by fire a pleasing odor to the Lord. And what is left of the cereal offering shall be for Aaron and his sons. It is the most holy part of the offerings by fire to the Lord. When you bring a cereal offering baked in the oven as an offering, it shall be unleavened cakes of fine flour mixed with oil or unleavened wafers spread with oil. And if your offering is a cereal offering baked on a griddle, it shall be a fine flour unleavened mixed with oil. You shall break it in pieces and pour oil on it. It is a cereal offering. And, your offer if, and if your offering is a cereal offering cooked in a pan, it shall be made of fine flour with oil. And you shall bring the cereal offering that is made of these things to the Lord. And when it is presented to the priest, you shall bring it to the altar. And the priest shall take from the cereal offering its memorial portion and burn this on the altar, an offering by fire, a pleasing odor to the Lord. And what is left of the cereal offering shall be for Aaron and his sons, it is the most holy part of the offerings by fire to the Lord. No cereal offering which you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven. 
that you should so notice it should not be leavened. And I think we can stop there. The cereal offering is a sacrifice, but it's both a sacrifice and a meal. It's an offering of the priest to God and an offering of whoever brings the, the, uh, the bread in the first place. Uh, so an offering of their offering to God. And then it's a gift of God to his priests in the form of a meal. So it's not just, you know, kind of an ordinary sacrifice. So the bread of the presence was the Sabbath sacrifice. It was the first act performed by the, the uh, replacement of the bread of the presence, the laying down of the new bread of the presence, and the consumption of the old bread of the presence was the first act of the Sabbath. The incoming priests would bring in the new bread of the presence. The outgoing priests would remove and consume the old bread of the presence. It was um, one of the principal temple services. Also during the festivals, during Passover, Pentecost, and Feast of Tabernacles, <clears throat> the priests removed the table of the bread of the presence and marched it around to show it to pilgrims since only priests were allowed in the Holy of Holies. And so when they did, they lifted up the bread and they said, behold, God's love for you. So does anyone remember Matthew talking about the bread of the presence? It's a quiz. I remember something about the disciples doing something. I'm horrible. The disciples doing That's something. Good, and Jesus you... saying like, the disciples. Yeah, you know, when uh, the David ate like bread of the That's presence, it. Like that. Oh, okay. Uh, but That's I good. Like, I don't know exactly what Jesus was saying, but I remember he mentioned that. Let's look at that. It's uh, chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, so uh, chapter 12, verse 1, at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain to eat. So notice Jesus doesn't pluck the grains to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you something greater than the temple is here. And we can stop there. I was trying to see if I can hear uh, the bread of the presence. So is it talking about, you know, the bread that they were eating? Because I didn't really hear the word, the bread of the presence in the whole reading. Well, I'm sorry, Joe, you, you dropped out for a minute. Yeah, I thought I was trying to, I was trying to hear the word, uh, the words, the bread of the presence, Yeah, you know, along the readings. But all, I could actually pick is them actually eating, you know, from um, the food that was actually preserved for the priests uh, during the Sabbath day. Right. The bread of the presence is also called the show bread. Right. Yeah. It's, it's called, the, it's translated as show bread here. And so what they're eating, what, what David's soldiers were eating was the bread of the presence. And although Jesus' disciples aren't eating bread of the presence, Jesus makes the same argument to argue that they could eat the bread of the presence. And since priests can 
are allowed to eat the show bread. So there's a prohibition from work on, on the Sabbath, but priests have to perform their priestly obligations, right? So that means that they're exempt from no work. So Jesus is making the argument that because that his disciples, therefore, are priests. Very much like David was a priest. We read about that when we, we studied chapter 12 a while ago. It's from 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 14. I don't want to read it again, but so... Jesus' point here is that if priests can, so the, 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 the central point of his argument is that something greater than the temple is here. And so what can be greater than the temple? Christ himself. God, yeah. Yeah, the temple is the home of God on earth. And so if something greater than the temple is here, it has to be God himself. Similarly, when Jesus says, uh, Jesus is arguing really that something greater than the Sabbath is here as well. So what could be greater than the Sabbath? the one who made the Sabbath. So in that case, Jesus' disciples become priests and implicitly, as long as they're in a state of sexual purity, they're allowed to eat the showbread. And they're also allowed simply to eat as part of their priestly obligations to survive. So the central point of Jesus' argument is that he is greater than the temple. So to put that another way, the bread of the face of God is a type. It's really, and you can see, you know, typology as a uh, a copy being replaced with the reality very clearly here. The bread of the face of God is only bread, right? The light shines on it, but that's, it's a deeply symbolic, um, it's filled with symbolism that the bread represents the face of God the light represents the people of God whose responsibility is to illumine the bread which, represent, which represents the face of God. And so the fulfillment of that, the antitype of that is Christ who is the face of God. The antitype of the menorah is us, the people of God who are responsible for illuminating, pointing light at Christ, of imitating Christ. But the bread of the presence also finds its typological expression in the Eucharist. So remember, on the table of the bread of the presence, we have bread and wine. The two of them are both a symbol of life and a symbol of sacrifice. And also their separation is a symbol of death. So that finds the bread of the presence is also a type that points to the Eucharist where we have the uh, body of Christ and the blood of Christ. We have the host and the chalice, but they can only be antitypes 
if they really are the bread of uh, the blood, of, the flesh of Christ, and the blood of Christ. Otherwise, they uh, otherwise they simply become poor substitutes for the bread of the presence. And in that case, you know, we have to profoundly change our understanding of the relationship between the Old and the New Test uh, Testaments. We've looked at, uh, so typologically, we've looked at Moses, right? And Jesus as the new Moses. We've looked at Passover and Jesus as the new Passover and the Passover lamb. We've looked at manna. And now we've looked at bread of the presence all typologically and finding their typological fulfillment in, in Jesus. So how does that relate to the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist? And how does that relate to you know, the issue of whether Christ is really presence, present or whether it's only a symbol? Mm. Well, the bread of presence was a type leading towards the Eucharist, which is the actual bread of Christ, uh, the actual body of Christ and blood of Christ. But the bread of the presence was what they had then as a representation of. Mm -hmm. So the bread of the presence is really sort of a sacramental representation. The Eucharist is also sacramental, but it's not a representation. And that's why it's typological, because it always points to something greater. Right, right. And so the other way basically points to the, would point to the, superiority, the, the superiority of the Old Testament, the, the inferiority of the New Testament, and the New Testament being a shadow and copy of the Old, te uh, Old Testament and the Old Covenant. So similarly, mana, the mana that came down from heaven in the Exodus was an unknown food provided by God to sustain the, uh, the Israelites on their journey through the wilderness. Mana, if, if that's all that mana is, then Old Testament mana is the same as New Testament mana, or maybe, in fact, you know, looking at the, the communion ceremonies and particularly evangelical churches, it seems clear that Old Testament mana is vastly superior to the new one, you know, the little plastic things of wine, which are an ecological catastrophe and little pieces of leavened bread. That's right, leavened bread. So, but on the other hand, mana is a heavenly food that sustains the Israelites through the wilderness, but it reaches its full fulfillment in the body of Christ, which is hidden under the form of bread and wine, veiled in, under the form of bread and wine. And so, if we 
if we see communion as simply a, a symbol, as the bread and the wine symbolizing something, we're all the people of God, we're all one people, all whatever, isn't that, that wonderful? The, uh, the relationship between the Old and the New Testament becomes completely broken. And the New Testament, the Old Testament becomes superior to the New Testament. And above all, something greater than the temple is not here. And indeed, premillennial dispensationalists want to rebuild the temple. They believe that that's required for Jesus to return. which is completely outrageous and blasphemous. Mm -hmm. Question. So, well, the new is greater than the old, right? Yeah. The estimate? Okay. Okay. The new. Okay, just making sure. The, yeah, the, the new finds its fulfillment in the old. The old, although it has meaning in its own right, also points forward to and, and is a shadow and copy of the new. A lesser copy. A lesser copy or a shadow. The old. Mm -hmm. The old. Okay. I am just a little like how the stuff that come first is copying the stuff that come second. Say that again, what? How like the first one is copying the second one. It does not copy in the sense of, in the sense of, um, of imitate copy in the sense of be similar to but not but missing many of its features so mm. for example traditionally well in both jewish and christian theology the tabernacle of moses and then the temples were built according to the pattern that God defined based on the heavenly sanctuary. So they're a copy of the heavenly sanctuary, but they're a copy lacking substantial fidelity because they're not the heavenly sanctuary. They're only, you know, kind of a poor imitation, but they point forward to the heavenly sanctuary. And then John, you know, when, when, she, in, in the, when Jesus cleanses the temple and, and he's asked, asked uh, um, you know, why, why did you do this? And he says, destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. He's saying that Jesus is the temple. So in some sense, you know, all the, the whole the, the structure of the temple and whatever, which is a copy of the heavenly sanctuary, points forward to Jesus. So it's a copy, but a copy that's substantially lacking in fidelity. If that may, does that make sense? Mm hmm Now we're back to where we were at the <laughs> at the end of last week's class. Well, time to quit then. <laughs> we have a good 15 minutes though. <laughs> yeah. So in the Last Supper, Jesus says, 
this is my blood of a covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So a covenant involves a sacrifice. A sacrifice is a pairing of blood and covenant. A sacrificial rite in which man approaches God. So the Passover meal was a sacrifice. Deliverance was accomplished by means of blood with blood being the symbol of life. Would Abraham be one then when he's ready to sacrifice his son? Yeah. Even though he didn't? Even though he didn't sacrifice his son. He sacrificed a ram, right? He sacrificed a ram, right? Yeah. The... Um, Within its context, I mean, I think that there are, you know, that there's one, there, there are, I think the sacrifice of Abraham has, you know, sort of multiple functions, one of which is, you know, that it's to be set within the context of, you know, the, the Canaanite and other Mideastern religions in which human sacrifices were widely known. So one of the, the, uh, the messages of the sacrifice of, of Abraham or of his almost sacrifice of Isaac is that human sacrifice is not acceptable. That God does not want human sacrifices and that God will provide a substitute. And then indeed the prophets say that God in fact is not even interested in animal sacrifices. God desires clean hands and a pure heart. So let's look at the Mosaic Covenant. It's Exodus chapter 24. And he said to Moses, come up, this is verse one. And he said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel and worship afar off. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall not come near and the people shall not come up with him. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances, and all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, and he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the sons of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins and half of the blood he threw against the altar. So notice here we have the blood of the covenant. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it upon the people and said, behold the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. So the blood sprinkled at the altar, the blood sprinkled upon the people. So a joining of two parties in covenant. Let's continue since this and part is important. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel, 
and there was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and wait there, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. And we can, we can stop there. The point of that last part is that the tablet of stone is a, conf is a, a confirmment, a confirm, confirm, confirming, confirms the covenant. Confirmation. Confirmation, good, thank you. It's a confirmation of a covenant. So, so you notice that we have the blood of the covenant. The blood is sprinkled at the altar. The blood is sprinkled on the people. So both parties of the covenant are sprinkled with blood. And then what happens? They see God, God right? ate with the people. What? So God ate with the people. Right. There was a meal to conclude the covenant ceremony. Right. So that's very significant. So that's very much like the Passover lamb, remember? You put the lamb on your doorpost, the blood of the lamb on, uh, on your doorpost, but you have to eat the lamb. If you don't eat the lamb, the blood of the lamb on your doorpost isn't, has no meaning. It's a covenant ceremony. So, one of the, the sort of interesting things about the Passover celebration versus the Last Supper, in the Passover celebration, everybody has their own cup. It's very much like communion among our non-liturgical, well, it's very much like communion among post-Calvinist Christians. Right, everyone has their little plastic thing. Actually, even in Calvinist churches, there's one cup. But um, so the thing is that at the Last Supper, there's a single cup which Jesus gives it to his disciples to drink from. That's very significant. So this is a covenant ceremony. But remember, we talked about prophetic action. It points forward to the next day. There is no actual blood yet. And Jesus is still very much alive. So the covenant ceremony becomes completed when we eat it and drink it. We join in the covenant ceremony. So what is the new covenant? Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, and I showed myself their master, says the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it upon their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each man teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, 
and I will remember their sin no more. So notice the new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers. So where is, what are the characteristics of, their, of the old covenant? The old covenant was written in stone. This one is going to be written in uh, hearts. Right, exactly. Right. I showed myself their master. Paul talks about how the relationship between, through the law between Israelites and and the Israelites and God is one of slaves to master, that the law is um, an external set of constraints that are imposed upon them. So God's law is not intrinsic, it's imposed. And implicitly, you know, imposed against it their will. So very, very difficult to do. But in contrast, God's law is to be written in our hearts. So how does it get written into our hearts? Conscience. Of the Lord. Through our function. What, Jeff? All sins through our consciences. Well, everyone has a conscience. Put there by the Holy Spirit when we're baptized. Through the sacraments generally, but how else? Remember, the heart is two things, the seat of emotion and the totality of a person. So your heart sums up who you are. It's not, you know, as in, I let Jesus into my heart, and you know, that means absolutely nothing. Here, the totality of God's law is written into the totality of our beings. It's not something over there, but how does that, so that happens through the sacraments, it happens through Baptism, it happens through confirmation, it happens through the sacrament of penance. How else does it happen? Through the Eucharist. The Eucharist. Through the Eucharist. Remember, you become who you receive. And the liturgy, too. And the liturgy. By, by hearing. Hearing. But especially the Eucharist. The Eucharist is a covenant ceremony with blood and flesh. It's a sacrifice. And here again, when we go back to, to um, I mean, if we, you know, reject the notion of the real presence, then we end up with, you know, this kind of mushy, sentimental, God's law is written in our hearts, or I let Jesus into my heart. And, you know, that's... Um, meaningless it's it's you know sort of really a travesty and it fundamentally i mean the important 
point here is that it fundamentally makes it ourselves as being, you know, sort of the activists, right? So I've let Jesus into my heart. God's law, I've, by doing that, I've allowed God's law to be written in my heart. So fundamentally, I'm the actor here, right? It's all about me. It's all about what I'm doing. So, so in contrast to that, the Eucharist, although we have to you know, cooperate and be disposed and recognize the real presence and recognize that we ourselves are a sacrifice, it's God's grace that does the work, not you know, my letting Jesus into my heart and whatever and and all of this, you know, sort of meaningless claptrap. The body and the blood of Christ are real and they have a real effect. So so next week we'll do probably the uh, the uh, Jesus prophecy about the desertion of the disciples, the threefold denial of Peter, and then maybe we'll do <coughs> Gethsemane as well, if there's time. <coughs>